The 2011 Steven Soderbergh film Contagion gave some pretty scary viewing as it showed the consequences of virus spreading around the world wiping out swathes of the human population. This is purely fiction and indeed could it happen in fact? And could life indeed mirror and overtake art in the near future? My name is Jonathan Swift, the Editor-in-Chief of Post Magazine and I'd like to welcome you to this live interactive webinar in association with the Chartered Insurance Institute's ongoing campaign Future Risks Covered, today covering the subject of pandemics and how the insurance and risk management fraternities could indeed mitigate the future, any future outbreak. Now I'm pleased to say joining me in the studio for this discussion I'd like to welcome Richard Waterer, Head of Marsh Risk Consulting UK and Republic of Ireland, Elaine Hayworth, Non-Executive Director at AMIC, Martin Dockrill, an Associate at JLT Specialty, and finally Malcolm Hyde, the Executive Director at the Chartered Institute of Lost Justice. But before I get our discussion underway, I have to remind you, the viewers, that, that you can take part in this. And to get the most out of it, we, we suggest you put some questions to us. You can do this by submitting the question by a tab on your screen. You can do this at any point during the discussion, and we'll come to them later. So get your thinking caps on, and we'll look forward to your questions. Perhaps, Richard, if I come to you first of all, just to ask really um, a question to frame this discussion, is another pandemic inevitable? I think it is inevitable, yes. I mean, history shows us that we experience two to three of these a century. We've got events such as SARS, avian flu, swine flu, fresh in the memory still. And I think regardless of how our society has advanced in terms of healthcare and so on, we can still expect another pandemic um, in, the, in the not too distant future. I think it is inevitable. Elaine, do you, do you agree? Yes, I do. It may not be the cholera typhoid of, of past um, pandemics, um, but I absolutely agree with Richard. There are new uh, divinations of, of viruses coming along all the time, and, and certainly there will be something. Martin, do you, do you hold sway with this opinion? I certainly do. Over, there's over 1,400 pathogens which can invade the human body. Um, of these, about 60% at least come from animals, not just chickens, monkeys etc etc and like um, Richard was saying they have in the past started off epidemics and pandemics it's going to happen in the future biology says so Malcolm come to you any any positives here or you uh, no, no I'm afraid I'm uh, with with the uh, the rest of the the, the uh, trio here um, I have to agree it is uh, absolutely going to happen at some point it's just a question of time and therefore being prepared for it when it does arrive so I come to you Elaine then and ask, you know, with the economic and societal changes, if we had another pandemic, how would it kind of compare to something like the 1918 influenza epidemic, which I believe is one of the kind of more famous and infamous kind of recent outbreaks? Sure. From, uh, I think from a health perspective, we are going to be better prepared nowadays. Um, we, we all eat better than we used to, even accidentally. We may not be having our five a day, as, as we should be, but um, most of us are getting healthier food intake. Um, we live in a cleaner society, um, and, and I think all of that will help from a health perspective. Um, you know, we had an issue where during the swine flu crisis, Liam Donaldson said, you know, 69,000 people were going to die because the numbers were extrapolated from what happened in Mexico. Well, there's no real way you can correlate the problem in Mexico with how we live in the UK. We have completely different lifestyles. However, there will be other issues. Globalization of the media will, will be a big issue that they certainly didn't have in 1918. Supply chain, which I know we're going to come on to later. So from a health perspective, I think we'll be better. There are other issues that we will have to prepare against. Martin? Um, certainly. If you're going to uh, compare like for like, um, various cities Scandinavia, um, in, in the Europe and Scandinavia, like uh, San Francisco, Philadelphia, London, if we have a pandemic now, certainly we'll be able to face that better. But I think the problem seems to be, which people don't seem to be really thinking about, is the issues regarding, um, well, catastrophic uh, effects on the production chain. We are so really, in, in this country, we rely heavily on imports from the third world. And there, let's face it, any epidemic or pandemic could quite easily just really have serious effects on our day-to-day uh, -day, um, business lives. Malcolm. Yes, well, I would agree. I mean, we're fortunate in, in the UK that uh, living accommodation is, is much better than it was in 1918. Uh, in 1918, following the First World War, um, humans were living very closely uh, with animals, and that was part of the, the reason for the, the exchange of the, the virus between humans and, and animals. Uh, and of course, that doesn't happen so much now in the UK. 
However, the flip side is, quite definitely, we are so reliant on third world countries for components and supplies, uh, and uh, of course we can't rely on our own healthcare to, to treat everyone throughout the world, so there is a, a real issue there, I, I agree. Richard, if I come to you on this. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with many of the comments um, already uh, mentioned by the panel. I think that from a health perspective, we are set up better to respond to it. We've got recent experience of communicating um, and containing um, illness and, and virus in, in recent memory. Um, I do think that um, the, the speed with which we can travel, the densification of cities, does present a different perspective on the health side of it and certainly, as the panellists have been saying, accentuates the risk that, um, that, that supply chain and, and business and economic impact may, may have. Perhaps I'll come to you, Martin, first on this issue of supply chain then, because it is something that we obviously has come up here and I, I hear about it, it's actually one of the perhaps more overriding factors which is ignored. Do you think many businesses kind of, they probably concentrate more on the staff rather than the supply chain when it comes to the potential of pandem pandemics? And they should, but certainly um, an important part of uh, any um, risk management process these days, I think, should deal with the, um, the supply chain. I think re regardless of the, we're talking today about pandemics or spread of disease, I think that really that risk management needs to evolve to help risk managers look at the supply chain problem. Because in the last couple of years, I think there's been various events where a lot of companies have been found wanting. Uh, last year, in particular, the uh, Japanese earthquake, there's companies there waiting for nine months for supplies. Companies in the UK had no idea this was the situation. And that really has got to be sorted out very, very quickly, pandemic or not. Malcolm? Well, yes, I mean, I think the Japanese uh, earthquake was, uh, was very realistic as to what could happen here. Um, just by way of example, certain um, made manufacturers found that only one supplier was able to supply certain goods. And that meant that the whole production line was, was stopped as a result of that. And quite clearly, that should be taken into account in any, in any risk plan, um, pandemic or otherwise. I would totally agree with that. So to your third, Richard, is it? Yeah, I don't disagree that supply chain is one of, the, one of the most critical issues in this. I would say that irrespective of how, um, how much insight you can gain into where your critical suppliers sit and what the impact of losing those suppliers might be on your ability to process your products or services, pandemics do present a very different risk profile than perhaps even uh, a, an earthquake or tsunami in that they affect such a wide proportion of people. So when you're talking about, or potentially do, so when you're talking about contingency planning around supply chain, it could well be that your second and third choice provider could be, could be facing precisely the same issues as, as, your, as your first one. So understanding the threat is important, but I think the, the exposure that, that pandemics potentially um, produce is, is very different from a lot of the other risk issues that could trigger supply chain interruption. Do you agree with this, Elaine? Yes, I do, absolutely. And I think it's, it's really important, um, and, and not just from a pandemic um, point of view, but any kind of business interruption. It, it needs to, your business needs to look at your procurement uh, supply chain element. A lot of businesses don't even realize which are the, the, the particular 50p widget that's going to throw them over when, when, it, when it falls down. And, and it's absolutely critical that a business impact assessment is carried out. What would happen if, and, and you start feeding that through your supply chain, and you, you know, your biggest supplier may be the post office because they deliver all your mail, but it's you know, that little component of your mobile phone that you can't get from Africa or Japan, which is going to cause your business to fall over if, if you're in that particular area. Martin, yeah, I, I had one example. It was um, a company, it's a food company, and you look at the, um, the products they make, and one of the biggest um, areas of profit was for the Germans and this vanilla dessert concoction so they're heavily reliant on this vanilla and we spoke to the uh, the management there the operations people the board and everybody said it's not an issue if this supplier we have um, can't get the supplies it's okay because there's four behind so what we did then was said okay fair enough spoke individually to each of these four uh, suppliers and said if this business come along what would you do where would you get your supplies from first one said Madagascar Second one said, Madagascar, I think you know where this one's going. <laughs> and that is just the, the situation. And I mean, at the moment, I'm, I, I work for a lot of the banks, and I know there's a big publicity about banks and people don't like them. Well, actually, a lot of the work they do doing the investment in the third world uh, is, is quite rewarding, really. You know, they build hospitals, they build schools, and that sort of thing. 
but it's absolutely just depressing sometimes when they say to the risk manager, okay, about this in the supply chain, what about that in the supply chain? Say that's not there. <coughs> and very often, it's not even that there's a, a response from the risk manager, it's like, no idea. And that's got to change, pandemics or not. Do you think, would you agree with Lane though, that the pandemic offers a different challenge to things like an earthquake and perhaps some other kind of major risks? I think that the pandemic is the most extreme um, interruption to uh, production and uh, the, the value of the, the um, supply chain. Malcolm, would you agree with that? Well, I would, I would agree with that. And I think the other fundamental point is uh, if we have a pandemic, we're also dealing with human emotions here because if you've got widespread deaths or sickness, um, it might not be that um, someone's actually got, got the illness, but they're looking for after people who have, or they're recovering from you know, a bereavement. So th that could have huge impacts on businesses um, that, that would have to be taken into account, let alone the actual fact that people are, are in and suffering. Well, I was just going to say, added on top of that is the fear element. I had a lot of people when we were going through the swine flu crisis, um, just ringing up, well, I don't really want to come in. My, my mother's brother's cousin's first wife is pregnant and, and you know, and, and how do I know it's not going to happen? So, you know, the media, without a question of a doubt, builds on this fear element and, and people are sitting at home and they're afraid. And, and it's very difficult to separate the fear from actual how can I say to this person, it's really, really unlikely. Well, I can, and I did in several occasions. But if you don't have somebody who has the knowledge behind them advising this person, their manager who doesn't know a great deal about it, they can feed that fear. And, and you know, it, as Malcolm says, it just, it, it's the ripple effect. It just goes out wider and wider and wider. And it's very, very difficult to manage. But Richard, do you think the media then, in a way, could help? the kind of potential kind of outbreak because obviously if people are staying at home they're not kind of you know meeting other people and essentially that might mitigate some of this as also acting as because as as it's acting as a scare a, a scare mechanism well i think one of the reasons why we're better prepared as a nation now than we were perhaps in 1918 is that the, the flow of communication is better um, i think that can have two effects one it can help us prepare better it can inform us quicker help contain the spread of a, a pandemic sooner and also can help our businesses prepare for it from a, uh, a sort of economic prioritisation perspective. But the flip side of that, of course, is that you do get sensationalism of an issue. You do get reporting of a pandemic that isn't in fact a pandemic. You do get scaremongering around the purchasing of pork products and so on. Um, so there is a balancing act to, to, be, to, to be found there. But I think, um, I think communication is actually the first line of defence when it comes to um, pandemics. And I think that you know, if businesses don't have a communication strategy in place, irrespective of what they're doing around their supply chain and their business continuity, then there's a real risk that the biggest potential impact of a, a threat of a pandemic is going to be the anxiety and the, the response of their people to, um, to the perceived threat that it produces. Martin, would you agree with that, that communication being, being key here? Um, yes, yes, I do. And, and um, when you read the uh, government's um, plans for the pandemic, uh, the press are part of that um, uh, response. But I think also, um, just coming come away from that, I think particularly with flu, there are so many mistakes which people just don't understand. There's so much information about the subject. And I think like, if you're going to start to develop a pandemic plan, you've got to start there really. Flu kills. Flu is not one of these. Um, little sort of episodes where you have 24 hour flu, it's not. And there's always these jokes around saying, you know, children get colds, men get flu, and women just get on with it. And yeah, you're probably, probably right. But, in, but you may look at these people who uh, have had the, 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 this pandemic flu, there is no resistance at all to the virus. And people just go down within seven hours or an hour. And that was the situation in 1918. Uh, you well, absolutely. I, I suffered from swine flu, so um, I, I've first had experience, and I can tell you, I, there was no way I could get out of bed. I was away on holiday, um, but I, myself, my son, both both had it, and there was no, nothing we could do. And I think the test was, you know, if there was a twenty-pound note on the other side of the room, would you have got out of bed and picked it up? And the answer to that was most definitely not. Um, and I think so. The media and the communication can be about. What, you know, what, what are the signs, what are the real signs of this? And if you've shown those or exhibiting those signs, what should you then do? And quite clearly, we don't want people who are contaminated going to large 
portions, uh, areas uh, and contaminating other people. But then it's the ripple effect and it's managing that risk so that people aren't put off going to work just because they've got a, a slight sniffle uh, rather than actually having, uh, having the flu. And I think that, that's, that, that is crucial. So, but I think if we look back at last time, as soon as it was communicated that there was an issue, most offices introduced hand wipes and that sort of thing and much better um, communication about let's, let's not spread this. And I think that helped considerably and I think that's, that's a, a key message to get out, that we can actually intervene. We might not be able to uh, completely win the battle against nature, but we can certainly fight a battle against nature. Can I just ask then, I mean, perhaps I'll come to you first on this, Martin. Do, do you think that people are in any way, um, because they're changing uh, our lifestyles, we are actually less immune to certain viruses. I mean, I don't know how, because if people talk about that in the old days, you know, you'd be surrounded by mud, you know, the old, old wife's tale about it, because they used to play in the mud. The kids were obviously more immune to essentially various things because they were exposed to them more. Nowadays, as you said, you know, children perhaps are a bit monocuddled more. I don't, I don't know. I think, well, again, I think it starts from the um, misinformation. Basically, a pandemic, is a the introduction of a um, new virus or infectious agent into the human uh, population and there is no resistance to it and that is the issue and the surprising thing was you know with the results we've seen so far in the 2009 uh, deaths 40 percent of those people who died didn't have weren't asthmatics no they didn't have heart conditions they were normally healthy and that is a situation you, you, we found in, and that is probably one of the big concerns. And, it's, and the same happened with SARS. SARS by far was only something like 10,000, 9,000 people um, uh, were involved, and only about 10% of them uh, unfortunately died. But again, people didn't seem to know what's happening at all. It happens. Hello? It, it's not about people. It's about the pathogens. They're getting cleverer. They're getting smarter. Mother Nature is turning around and saying, well, if you can defeat me that way, I'm going to get you this way instead. It's, it's, it's evolution of illness, which is, which is exactly the same as evolution of people. You know, we have two arms and two legs because at some point in our evolutionary process, it was decided that was more practical. A pathogen is going through the same evolutionary series. It's not about us. It is now about the illnesses that are clever enough to, to take us on and, and some people will be defeated. Some people will be less immune due to other illnesses that they may have had, but they may not have had any as, um, you know, it, it, it's just circumstances. Pathogens are more clever. And this comes to the globalisation issue because they're getting cleverer, and I'll come to you on this, Richard, but obviously we are now a much more kind of, we're, we're travelling more, people travel more, they travel around the world more these kind of, they, they get spread more easily. Is it, would, would you agree with that? And is this a concern? And yes, I think, well, I think travel is one of the, the, the reasons why the um, um, epidemics like this can spread faster. Um, uh, also the concentration of people within certain cities and also the concentration of people within travel hubs, so major airports and so on, where you've got incoming and outgoing people, so you don't have to be on the go in order to, to spread this. So I think, I think that society is set up to, to, to pass this on more um, and the densification of uh, in major cities and so on um, does sort of uh, has the potential to exaggerate that but um, and, and that sort of balance that counteracts I think any of the sort of health benefits that we're seeing in some of the more developed um, Western um, economies so yeah absolutely I think. So I understand Malcolm you, you, you understand you caught um, so, I, so I flew at an airport. Yeah, well I, I blame it on the fact that my flight was delayed for 13 hours at Gatwick and uh, both my son and, and I went down with this. Um, my wife actually flew out the following day uh, and was not delayed and she didn't catch it so um, uh, so yes I do blame it that and I think the interesting point there is that we were flying to Portugal we met obviously a group of people in Portugal and by the end of the week several of those were complaining of the same symptoms but other people at Gatwick that day would have flown to America and to South America and all around the world and of course I suspect that what I caught was then taken around the world like that so I think that is, that is crucial um, and so that, that is certainly key to, to what happens that the, the rapid spread throughout the world uh, because of the, the rapid travel basically. Pleasure brings a question. I look up to you, Martin. Is when do you shut down travel hubs? Um, I mean, because <laughs> government's got a real, um, obviously, got a real problem with that. And already, some countries have said we're going to shut down straight away. Australia, in particular, and I think the uh, experience they had in 1918, where they actually delayed uh, the onset of the pandemic, there has given them a lot of confidence to do that. There's a lot uh, in, the, in the scientific community. There's a lot of um, issue about. Um, how effective it would be. And I think 
while there's, there's people talking about you could delay the onset by two or three, two or three weeks, um, it's just so difficult to find people who are going by, by plane if, it's, if they're sick or not, such the problem mm. with flu. And um, it's just becoming a, well, mathematically, the, the people who are looking at this have got so many different variables. The issue, I think, will, be, will certainly be, yeah, they will say to the government, it's not that bad, you probably, it's, not, it's not a big issue. The local issue is more important, you know, protecting people, quarantine, helping the sick. They will um, stop the spread more. But I think in, in, the, in the event of a, of a pandemic, every a lot of countries are going to say straight away, shut down the, air, the airlines. Elaine? If, if we take it back from, you know, sh looking to shut the airport hubs um, and, and bring it down to a risk manager's perspective in a business, actually, you can stop your people travelling. And, and in, in that way, you're trying to you know, uh, mitigate, that, mitigate that risk of, of people clustering in hubs. I know at T-Mobile, we, we stop people traveling between contact centers. Our contact centers were major hubs of this illness. And, and we actually said, no, we will isolate these contact centers until we can control it better. So in a way, while we can't shut down the hubs, how difficult that would be for any government to take that decision. Um, we can, of course, but it, it's unlikely. Actually, individual businesses can use that as a method of protecting their own employees. That, that was certainly one of the steps we took. Richard? Yeah, I think it's a very delicate situation. Um, there aren't any clear sort of key risk triggers that make it evident about when you should and shouldn't shut these public transport um, airport infrastructure. And I think one of the risks associated with doing so is that you may see some secondary impacts in other areas. You're going to get large groups of people contained in um, airports and other areas. It may take uh, more of a drain on um, emergency services and authorities, which in turn may lead to civil unrest and, and other much more day-to-day -day, um, issues that we, that we deal with. And so there is a, a very, very delicate balancing act about when it is right to, do, to take a decision as important as that one and the, the implications of doing that other than simply um, protecting the health of, um, uh, of, of, your, of your population. Okay. At this juncture, I'd just like to remind you all that um, to submit questions, you just use the tab on your screen. Um, we'll come to the questions later on, so get your thinking caps on, that'd be much appreciated. Um, we've talked about, uh, about supply chain. Um, can I just ask, given the fact that you know, there's a lot of coverage given things like terrorism and, and other such risks, where do you think a pandemic currently kind of sits in, in a risk manager suite of concerns? Perhaps I'll come to you on that first, Elaine. Well, for me, and, and we've discussed this earlier, pandemic is, is much more threatening, but possibly less likely. So a terrorist attack is generally going to hit one one area, one, you know, it, it's normally big enough to, to, to identify very quickly and, um, you know, elements of your supply chain may be affected. Because pandemic is so airborne, so global, all parts of that supply chain could be could be attacked. As we said, if you know, if if your first supplier can't make it, and you've got three more, and they're all using the same country, you know, that entire country is going to have lost its its supply ability. Um, so. I don't want to start panicking people, but you know, I, I definitely think pandemic is a much bigger issue than, than terrorism um, because it will have a wider impact. Richard? I mean, I routinely still see it on our clients' risk registers. As Elaine says, it's, it's low probability, it's high impact. So it, it requires perhaps a slightly different approach and, and um, management tactic than something that is, that is more likely to happen. I think the reason why it, it, it still exists in the forefront of a lot of risk managers' minds is, is that it presents a very different set of risks than a typical um, business interruption risk would. It's much more likely to affect a larger proportion of the population. You know, the Department of Health estimates that in a pandemic, 25% of our country would be off sick for up to a month. You know, that is going to have repercussions that stretch far beyond a typical you know, business interruption or even sort of liability type exposure. So I think that part of the reason why it occupies the attention of risk managers still is the fact that there is this degree of uncertainty and um, even the best business continuity plans in the world um, may not be equipped to deal with this particular scenario. Martin? UK government number one um, risk they're concerned about, pandemics. United States, same thing. I mean, yeah, a lot of conversation has gone around the, um, the bioterrorism risk. 
and uh, the last month with the um, publication of the uh, the scientists who managed to uh, link the H5N1 virus and the uh, 2009 virus. Governments were suddenly, well, especially the American government, suddenly saw this as a big uh, terrorist issue, and they are taking it seriously. But I think as well for most of us, um, it is very, very low chance of these things happening. American country. Well, but one advantage we do have these days is that a pandemic is likely to be quite well monitored and, and predicted. So whereas we can't necessarily predict a storm, uh, a surge event like that, or uh, a hurricane or, and things like that very quickly, um, uh, because we don't have uh, the time to do it. With a pandemic, generally speaking, there will be the sudden uh, notice by the uh, science scientists that uh, it's transferred from, say, birds to humans, and that's a big leap. So having done that, we, we know that's happening. And then it's going from human to human, which isn't such a big leap. Um, but we know then it's, it's happening. Um, and so the key there is that we have got some advantage on this, that we, we can predict them and, and, and start modelling the effects that it's happening. I take on board what we said about uh, not necessarily using the same guidance from Mexico and then and, and, uh, you know, using those figures and saying that's what would happen here. Um, but on the other hand, it is a good uh, indicator that this is what's actually happening. So we have got some advantages against nature perhaps there. We've already mentioned air travel as, as, as an area of, of concern, but can I just ask which kind of areas of business and industries would be probably most impacted um, by a pandemic? I'll come to you on that first, Richard. I, mean. I think there's probably two different ways of, of, of thinking about this. You've got sectors that are clearly going to be affected very quickly, travel, tourism, entertainment, food, um, food production. But then I think leaving the sectors aside, you've, you've, got, a, you've got just general businesses that, that, that trade globally. Um, and either have a section of their workforce in countries that are more prone to a pandemic, or as we've been discussing earlier, critical suppliers that, to, that produce component parts or ingredients um, or whatever it is that make up their, their final products, that in the event that they lose that, their business is going to take a real hit. So um, I think historically there's been this, this sort of assumption that it is just the, the, the businesses that rely very heavily on human capital that are going to get affected by a pandemic, but, but in reality, any business that trades globally in any way um, is going to be significantly hit. Malcolm, would you mm. agree? Well, I, I do agree with that, and I, I, but I just also come back to, we, we talked about maybe shutting airports and that sort of thing, and, and I think if, if you look at doing that kind of thing, you've got to imagine the sign that is sending out to the general public uh, and the fear that, that that would create. We talked earlier about maybe possibility of civil unrest, and I think uh, we import a huge amount of our food into this country. Uh, you shut down the, the airports and we don't import the food. There's then f food shortages. You can just imagine the, the impact of that. So um, I think all those things are, are crucial, crucial to take into account. So I think the, the, um, the, you know, it's a case of managing the situation. Um, and I think that you would then have to um, prioritise what, what are the most important key services in the UK and make sure that they are active and, and can proceed. Uh, and there'd be other aspects that wouldn't be so crucial. So uh, I think that, that would be a key part of this. Well, I think you had any other industries that come spring to mind that might be impacted? I think these days, because we've got globalisation, just-in-time manufacturing, I think every sort of company is going to be affected to some degree. And but I think one of the really sort of disappointing uh, reactions from risk managers is that they just don't have the depth to consider what are the issues. Um, there was the internet, for instance. Again, it's the big question. If everybody worked from home, could you have the internet? But come back down to that level. Have you, you know, if, if you're there with your wife or home, have you got computer each? Um, travel, have you got other things to issue about? And people don't seem to think about this. There's certain, certainly, uh, you can look at different um, industries, but it's a human problem, and that affects us all to some degree. Hello. On behalf of risk managers. Well, on behalf of risk managers, <laughs> I'm just going to stand up for us here. Um, if, you know, while, while we're all talking about strategic global issues, if, if I were to bring it right back down to ground level, you know, I worked for T-Mobile for two years during the swine flu issue. Um, so FMCG, fast moving customer goods, consumer goods, are, is an area that's going to have a problem. Um, any type of retail where customers are walking in and out carrying 
potentially a pathogen that they don't even know they have. For the companies who, who own those retail stores, having to clean them all the time, having to reassure their staff. And you know, again, in retail, you're looking at a lot of employees who are you know, working in a shop for five days a week and then go home. Um, they don't have the same type of longevity that, that people working in, in the back office like the risk managers do. Um, and uh, you know, they get concerned. And if, you have, if you're running a shop with five people in it and three of them go down, you can no longer run that store. You know, it's not viable anymore. So your business suddenly starts to have a cash flow impact because people, even if they could get in and give them all this, these diseases, they're still not spending their money. And, and suddenly the impact, the ripple effect of the economic impact against your business and then the wider economic status of the country, which, let's face it, is already in a mess. We certainly could do without a pandemic right now. But I, I think retail is, from my own experience, retail is, is certainly something that would be hit quite hard. And on that basis, do you think some industries are better prepared than others? And are, is it, would it be said that bigger companies are better prepared than smaller companies? I don't think it'd be fair to say <coughs> that at all. I think it depends on the people running the business continuity plans and how seriously businesses take those. You know, I set up a pandemic working group at T-Mobile. We had representatives from each functional area of our business to ensure that we could identify our key critical workers, the numbers of people who we may have to have working from home and ensure that they could have access. We also gave ourselves the ability to see who was signing in and we could take them off if, if they were not considered a key critical employee. Now, your finance director isn't a key critical employee in times of crisis. It's Bob at the payroll desk. Do you know, it's so people have to be very, very objective from a risk management point of view. Yes, our CEO is important, but he's important because we put him in front of the camera. We can't find somebody else to do that. Our CEO is the representative of the business, but actually in a crisis, no, he can't log on because we really need the people who are running our, our you know, finance programs or, or IT or network security programs. That's one of the big questions, who gets the tummy flu? Obviously, your CFOs want it. But like in the retail trade, it's that um, person on the checkout. Mm -hmm. They are the super spreader. Yep. They've got to be uh, helped. They've got to do the job. Otherwise, the whole system falls down. We've got to do everything we can to help them. And that's one issue. That quite a few retail trades just don't seem to grasp at all. It's almost like, here's our pandemic plan. What we've done is basically automated the checkouts. So the super spreader issue isn't there anymore. Yeah, OK, but... Where are you going to get your supplies from? Say there's a petrol shortage. Where does your food come from? And it's like, we've oh, not thought about that. That's really what pandemic plans should be. And that really is just how, perhaps it's me, just disappointing with the approach you get from some, uh, some uh, risk managers. And do you think, Martin, there are industries that are, or in your experience, are better prepared than others? I mean, or do you think it really is a kind of bit of a, it does, it just, it's companies and the people who are there rather than actually in industries? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's particular companies. I mean, I'm, I, only a couple of uh, industries that our companies have actually managed to do a um, simulation. And like uh, the, uh, the UK finance industry in 2006 did an excellent one, and they learned an awful lot of, about that, about you know, people are going to be away working from home. And that report, I think, is, uh, is, is going to go down as a classic. But they found other things out as well. Basically, cash, there's going to be no cash around. For the banks, people, 50% of the banks are going to be ill, et cetera, et cetera. And that's something you really people have got to consider. And I remember there was also about 2000, 2004, 2005, the US airports tried to do a simulation, and it was a fiasco. I mean, it was just a fiasco, you know. People, people you know, the people with this sick plane coming off, we're <coughs> gonna put them, oh, we're gonna put them there in this warehouse. Yeah, well, where's the water for them? And it just got on like that. I mean, obviously, since then, it, the US has really sorted itself out, the airports. But it's just so surprising that a major um, part of our, our lives, uh, just basically on the first attempt, just uh, just wasn't there, was found wanting. And uh, that's something you've got to consider. And we're talking today all the time about economies, but uh, society, hospitals especially, 20% of nurses, 20% of doctors, and their, let's face it, their um, uh, sick level is going to be a lot higher. And that's what's happened in the past, and that is the big issue. Talking about this, Sam, I mean, thank you, Richard. Do you think that the risk models that people are using, or insurers use, and, and risk managers use, are in a way, are they up to date, out of date? I mean, can they quickly become passe? I think they are one source of information for the risk managers and the insurance industry itself, actually, to, to, to prepare um, for the onset of a potential pandemic. They're, they're one source. 
Um, another, of course, is getting closer to um, their insureds and understanding the extent to which they are going down some of these um, some of these paths in terms of risk um, risk man management. There are models that exist in the industry. Those models um, take in you know, several thousand different pandemic type events. They produce you know, good data. I think there's a risk, um, as I mentioned earlier, that um, they they paint 1918 as potentially the kind of the the, the, the height of significance, so this, is, this is as extreme as it's going to get. And there's a potential, of course, that with the density of the population now, compared to 1918, it would, it would only take a, a small percentage up, uptake for that, that figure to be much more significant. But I think the models are there. I think it would be, I would err on the caution of using them solely to, um, as, as a risk manager, to take decisions about this. It's as much about you know, understanding your own business, what matters to it, and and the, um, the way in which your, your organisation is, is set up to respond to it. Elaine, you, you were nodding along in Absolutely. agreement there. Yeah, I, you know, as a risk manager, uh, models are great, but to me they're models. It's like you know, going to school and taking an MBA. It doesn't actually teach you anything until you get out there into business and learn how business operates. Um, getting to the heart and soul of how your business operates, it's, it's, it's what I love about being a risk manager, touching off all those key points within your business area, because it's not the people at the top of the food chain that can tell you what's important. It's people much lower down the food chain. And, and they're the people to connect with. And you know, on behalf of risk managers who I'm desperately trying to defend here, there are some really, really good people out there who get out, talk to everybody, talk about how the, how the business is run, bring the modelling with them. You know, modelling isn't useless, it's one tool, as Richard has said, um, and, and I bring a model with me and say, well, this has happened in the past, how would we react to, to something similar? And then I do the testing, you know, the whole BCM scenario testing, what would happen if? And during the banking um, testing, you know, uh, I, I worked for Barclays and, um, and we were asked, you know, what would happen if everybody whose surname began with M was not available in your business? Can't even begin to tell you what a nightmare it was. But, but actually, it really focused people's minds, you know, just taking that as one example. How do you identify the key critical employees? You have to ask. You have to get out there and talk to people. And you have to have built up your credibility as a risk manager high enough to get the answers. You don't want somebody coming back saying, who are you and, and what difference does it make? You have to be known as the person who's pulling this all together. So you need buy-in from the very top. Absolutely no question about it. But it's the people much further underneath those layers who are going to help you most. Martin, what's your experience with models and relating to pandemics? Um, well, in the last couple of years, I mean, the amount of um, uh, work has been done with, with um, computers and the advances of artificial intelligence. When you look at these things on a global scale, it's quite surprising. Um, what, what the effects could be of just one particular thing, and that's the issue with pandemics. So many things can happen. Um, I, th I think the risk, you've got to look at these um, plans, look at these um, models, and really sort of think, yeah, just take them as a simulant, just take them as something which could happen. But really practice, practice, practice what you preach. Get confidence in. Um, from, from your staff, get confidence in the, in the board, get confidence in the government actually as well, as, as, as the film showed. You need confidence in the government, and you need confidence in, in, in the um, people leading the company if you're going to get people coming to work, and if you're going to get really co uh, the business going forward. Finally, Malcolm. Well, yes, I think Martin's hit the nail on the head there. I think, for me, uh, if I can use the analogy of uh, you know, going to a, a property after, after a severe loss, they might have a business continuity plan, but people sometimes panic and don't actually use it. So that's the first point I'd say, is let's, let's use it. Um, 2020 hindsight is a wonderful thing. Um, and the best way to obtain that, of course, is by modeling it and actually doing it uh, like, you, like you did. Um, and I think if you're doing that, so you're actually creating a situation where you say, right, how is this going to pan out if we do this? Um, so you've trialed it, you know what the experience is. Um, you can gain an awful lot of experience from that, an awful lot of knowledge, and then you can change your plan accordingly. Uh, and I would then strongly recommend that you uh, adopt the, uh, uh, amend the plan. But then, of course, when they do have a disaster, make sure you do use the plan. Don't just panic and, and go off somewhere else. I was just going to say, it, doing the scenario testing um, means that when it actually happens, people are going to pay attention to you. 
if you've gone through a scenario test with key people, um, they know you know your subject, they know you know what you're talking about, and they know that you're taking them seriously too. And, and for me, that was a huge credibility piece that, that all risk managers have to do. People look at risk managers, oh, they're, you know, they're killing off everything, we can't do anything without saying yes, please, first of all. That's not what risk management is about. Risk management is just about doing it in while protecting the employees and the business at the same time. There are better ways of doing everything, and that's what risk managers try to achieve. But for me, going from scenario testing to actuality, people recognized my name, they knew what I was talking about, they knew I was serious, and they knew they had to do what they were told. And I don't mean that in quite the, the you know, you will do what you're told. But, but sometimes in a crisis, you need somebody who's going to stand up and make decisions and say, this is what you're going to do. And, and, and it drives your business along. It protects it at the same time. Martin? Actually, you're right there. I think perhaps it might be a British problem. But certainly, if you try to speak to pandemic um, um, issues with Canadians or Asians, they will listen to you as if your life depended on it. Because quite literally, a couple of years ago, it did. But there's some, obviously, some countries who just quite lax on this sort of thing. But that's to their disadvantage if, if a pandemic comes. Okay. Richard, did you yeah, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I agree with Elaine. I think that, that, that scenario testing, particularly around an issue such as this, is so important because even if you've used your business continuity plan on a dozen occasions for more localised threats, this is going to present a whole range of different impacts. Um, you made the comment earlier about the importance of the CEO in the context of all of this, and I think it would take quite a brave risk manager to turn around and tell, us, tell them that the CEO was, was not particularly important. I do actually think that the CEO has a... Um, and the board, in fact, have a critical role mm -hmm. to play in this around the management of the crisis. And there is a, um, notwithstanding the fact that the priority should be around the health of the workforce, there is also a duty to shareholders often to demonstrate that your business is going to continue and that you're not going to have any um, unavoidable, or sorry, I should say avoidable um, um, sort of impact on, on, on your business. So the behaviours, I think, and the, the communication that comes from the board in, in an event like this, or even in the threat of an event like this, is, um, is pretty critical. OK, at this juncture, just to like to remind you one final time, that if you want to submit a question, uh, use the tab on your screen, and the panel will take these questions in a bit. Um, one question that has come in, and um, it's never going to come to this, and I'll probably go to you first, and there's Richard. The question is really, which classes of insurance would most be impacted by a pandemic, in, in your mind? I think there's a range of um, insurances that um, businesses would look to um, respond. The obvious ones are sort of life and health policies, but um, you know it's going to cause a big business interruption exposure. The extent to which a BI policy can be triggered by an event that is not a typical insurable event, um, where there is a, 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 a physical trigger such as a fire, is, is certainly under question. I think liability is going to be a, a significant class both on EL and PL. Again, it comes down to definition of in injury. And it also comes down to the extent to which the insured can demonstrate that they have adequately defended against those sorts of losses. Um, and we were just talking, actually, I was just talking about governance. Um, it's, it's not inconceivable that there would be DNO claims coming in from a, um, an event like this. So I think it has the ability to, to impact on a wide range of classes. Um, and you know, the, the real risk, or sorry, the real challenge for the insurance industry, of course, is that from a portfolio perspective, you're talking about potentially all businesses and not just one sector or one region. Elaine? Well, uh, you know, I absolutely agree with Richard. It, it could impact in so many different insurance um, themes. But, but one thing I would say that, that can happen within companies is if your risk management processes and your insurance processes have been separated, which happens quite a lot. Now, in, in, in firms I've worked for, I've kept them together because I, I, I can manage both. Um, but, you know, they, they do get separated. And if your risk manager doesn't quite understand the insurance implications, if your insurance manager doesn't quite understand what your risk manager is up to to try and mitigate what's going on you can have a disconnect and then information going to the insurance company is not quite as pure or up to date as it should be and, and I think it's critically important in, in in major impacts like this whatever type it is pandemic volcanic ash whatever is going on that your risk and insurance people are talking to each other because the most important thing for an insurer is to get absolute consistent information that's giving them what they need um, before for claiming on a policy. Martin, if I come to you. Um, I think it's one of those instances really where yeah. um, insurance almost um, isn't an issue. I think the risk management is the most important thing. Um, that is going to give confidence in the staff that you, can, that you, you know what you're doing. 
Um, of course, as a, as, a, as a small aside, I, I seem to remember um, we were talking um, to quite a few American companies in 2005 about what would happen if there was a pandemic and you know, we're going to have these 20% um, people off, etc, etc, about renewals. And quite a few did sort of say, yeah, we could probably renew by three months or six months, it would be automatic, we'd put a clause in the policy. I think that's something which perhaps the industry should think about again on these instances, you know. We can't, you know, insurance is insurance, let's face it. Let's put it to one side. But if it is, if you have got an issue and it does arise, let some, some, some insurers will, you know, come to, uh, come to the fore and uh, renew automatically for three months or whatever. Come to you finally on Malcolm. Well, yes, I mean, I, I think it's going to be you know, manufacturing, production, um, part of the food chain, um, and uh, but I also totally agree with Richard about the DNO claims. I think you know if there was a sign there that um, uh, directors and officers hadn't taken um, the guidance properly, hadn't taken the correct steps, um, shareholders might may say, "Well, we're going to target you. Uh, we've suffered losses as a result of this. This was preventable, uh, and so that, that's that's feasible too." And, and are, are many clauses in some policies, like events policies regarding cancellation, that actually will not pay out in the event of a um, pandemic? Is that something that's quite normal to have pandemic um, clauses or not have them in there? I don't know how modern policy insurances have changed. Perhaps, Elaine, you might have some insight to that. I think they're actually more inclined to have it included <laughs> because the risk manager is going to go back and say, you know, I did receive a policy, a terrorism policy once that excluded terrorism, which I found quite fascinating. But clearly, you know, the insurer just didn't think anybody was going to read the policy. And uh, being a sad person I am, I read my policy top to bottom and realised that terrorism was excluded from my terrorism policy. So I think it's it's more about making um, in, ensuring that your policies are appropriate. So if your if your policy comes back and it says it excludes pandemic well in any risk manager's mind that would be a red flag now it may if as i said before the the two um areas have been separated it may not be a red flag in insurance specialist mind but if a risk manager thought they would absolutely jump up and down to to bring that back in i i i don't quite agree that insurance is just insurance and it shouldn't be uh, too big of a concern within a pandemic environment i think there are reasons we have insurance policies and if we're paying for insurance policies why would we ignore it when our business is going through a critical um stage because of a pandemic so uh, you know I'm, I'm kind of more inclined to think i'd like to see that insurance policy and i'd like to make sure my business interruption, my DNO and everything else covers those areas where my business is under crisis. Contingent BI, you know, it's a big, big deal at the moment. Everybody's talking about it because it's, it's you know, business interruption where it's not a building that's fallen over, where it's not obvious. But contingent BI is, is a big element of pandemic cover. So, you know, it, it still has to be included in, in the, the policy documentation. I think, I think the relationship between risk management and insurance in an event like this is, is really critical, as you were saying, Elaine. I think it's, it's also um, sort of casts a few interesting scenarios. If you take the, the sort of conscientious risk managed business that perhaps runs events and decides for the safety of the public to cancel um, an event where their competitor keeps the event running and then decides to make a claim on their event cancellation policy and is told, well, there was no need to cancel the event. Um, it's, it, it creates an interesting dynamic between risk and insurance. I think what you were saying earlier about the importance, if, if the team is not sitting in one group, the importance of those two functions, sure. collaborating and, and working together through scenario testing and so on on these real events is, is critical. Coming back to the, um, the viewers' questions out there, this is a question from Owen um, Boswava of Correlated Risk Solutions. I'll come to you first on this, Malcolm. Um, they ask, um, is there an IT aspect, into, IT aspect to this in relation to the fact that um, obviously we know that mapping and geographic information systems are used for things like flood risk. Could we use the same kind of technology really to make, um, to essentially map pandemics and potential spread of pandemics? Well, I guess we would look to the WHO, the World Health Organization, for for this kind of data because they would know where uh, you know there has been a transfer of a. Uh, a virus from uh, the animal kingdom, if you like, to, to humans, and that's basically the, the first the first trigger. Uh, and so I would say yes, uh, we, but we would be looking to the, probably the WHO to get that kind of data and then decide how we're going to model this and how it's going to work through. And I guess that's what I was talking about earlier, the fact that we can uh, actually plan how we're going to uh, react to this because we can model and, and see how things are going. Uh, so I would agree, yes, that there is that possibility, quite definitely. 
Martin, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was talking about this before. I mean, since the advent of the Cray computer and supercomputers, artificial uh, intelligence, you know, these are sort of computers really where if you, when you switch them on, the lights outside dim down. They're just huge. And they really can see so many sort of permutations and combinations of what can happen. So, yeah, we, 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 well, like I say again, there's so many different things that can happen during the pandemic. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be able to find out, can you deal with these sort of issues? All these really superb computer programs can do is just give you some guidance. That it's not how it's going to happen. You can bet your bottom dollar that's the situation. So, yeah, we'll use them and they really are good. But don't put total faith in them. Well, during the swine flu crisis, um, which I refuse to call a pandemic, it was a crisis, um, the World Health Organization did issue maps, a global map every week with red, blue, yellow spots of, of where it was happening, as, as was reported to them through governments of various countries. And, and I, you know, I can still remember having a, a sheaf of, of, of global maps of, of where our, the hotspots were, um, with, with very accurate data on the numbers of people who were affected and not affected. And actually, while you don't use it as your bedrock, it, it is a very, very useful guide, a very useful tool, and, and IT is critical in, in, in how that works, and, and it, was, it was very, very useful for me, because a lot of people see things visually. So they see a map on the wall with red spots in South America, and a red spot in Europe, and you know, right down to a, a red spot in the UK, right down to a red spot in uh, you know, various areas of the UK where the, where the numbers are critical. Um, and, and that's a very, very useful tool to, to help map your response. You know, a tool nonetheless, but useful. Three cheers for red, white and blue. I mean, the UK it actually is a, a great centre for this sort of a modelling. Imperial College, a guy called Ferguson, just does a superb job. And he's the guy you will see. Uh, we use these sorts of diagrams where you can suddenly see the way how the pandemic could, could rise. And these people like Longini in the States and Lipsoch really, um, it, like I say, in recent years, it's suddenly had this fantastic capa IT capability to do this sort of thing, which we didn't have before. I come to you, Rich. On there. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with most of what the panel have said. I think exposure assessment models and maps are readily available today, um, and um, but they only tell you so much. They they give you a sense of the extent of the exposure where it's, and where it's likely to come from. Um, that in itself won't help your business to manage it. Um, and as we were discussing right at the beginning of this debate, um, if we all assume that the a pandemic is inevitable. It becomes all about what you do in your business to prepare for it and the steps that you take to ensure that you can continue trading and that your people are safe and healthy in the event that it does happen. Sorry, Sorry it's, it's just important to know that with a p pandemic, it can affect different areas differently. So while we, you know, it might be very easy to sit there and say swine flu travelled in this direction, um, avian flu travelled in that direction. It, it's very important that these are only guides and, and you know, a, a, a another type of flu or a another type of pathogen um, could travel in a completely different direction. So another question this time, I'm from Peter Baring of PB Risk Management Limited. Uh, I'll come to you first on, on this, Elaine, actually. He says that a major issue of pandemics might be the issue of expat management and how you actually repatriate them or do you leave them in situ? And so, you know, and how how do people react to this kind of situation during a, a pandemic? Well, well, that's a very personal thing, and and you know, we had lots and lots of HR policies about how we were going to do things and how we weren't. But in fact, the way it worked for us was that we picked up the phone to these people. Do you want to come home? Is it necessary for you to come home? Um, or are you particularly exposed? Or we would get on the phone and say, actually, you're not particularly exposed. It's not so bad. Now, we had um, big contact centers in Manila in the Philippines. And clearly, contact centers were a problem. You know, isolated bunches of people all together um, were spreading the illness. There's no question about it. But we didn't have nearly the impact in Manila that we had in um, our Scottish or, or Welsh uh, contact centers. So so you have to engage with the people who are involved. And, and it comes back to this fear element. Um, if they're not afraid, and, and the people in Manila were not hearing the news that the UK was spreading. And I suspect if they got a, a, a feed of News 24 or Sky, they'd have been on a plane in a second. But actually, they said to us, yeah, you know, we're fine. So sometimes over-legislating, over-policy driving, it is a mistake. It, it, you can actually step a little bit further back and, and your policy can say, we will do whatever you need us to do to help you. 
and you pick up the phone, well, actually, I've got four kids in school. They're absolutely fine. There hasn't been a single case of swine flu. We're staying where we are. And you know, the woman who lives down the road, oh, I'm pregnant. I want to come home. I want to be protected. I can't get Tamiflu here. You just react to the way people need you to react. That, that's the strength of a big business. You can do whatever somebody needs you to do. It's more difficult for smaller businesses who have people um, you know, situated further away. But for a big business who have got the resources, you can do whatever people need them. Richard? I agree with everything Elaine's just said. I think it is down to the, um, the intuition of the business and the response that they choose to take. And that's a response that they don't take single-handedly. They take in consultation with their own employees, particularly if their employees are in overseas territories that may be deemed as a higher risk. So I think it's all about open channels of communication, allaying fears and anxiety, but responding to fears and anxiety if they are seen. So I agree with you. Yeah. Martin, do you have anything to add on there? Um, not really. Like you say, it's been said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not an issue with people perhaps coming in and where you keep them if they do come in and perhaps kind of keep I think that exactly that happened at, at, at Barclays Capital. We had during the um, SARS crisis. We had one of our top executives fly in to London from Hong Kong and, and, and then it all blew up in Hong Kong and we we're saying, you're not going anywhere. And he was frantic. He said, I need to go home. You're not going anywhere until we allow you. So sometimes you do have to put that heavy foot down and say, no, we need to keep you here. But it is about people. Yeah, I think, let's face it, during the pandemic, the management of macho, of, of macho people is going, to be, uh, is going to be an issue. Uh, because, like I said, it's, you know, oh, I can sort this out, I've got the flu, I'm a man, blah, blah, blah. It's just a nightmare for the rest of the company. And, it, and its effects are going to be uh, so, so disastrous. Just going back to what I was saying a couple of seconds ago, I mean, again, you've got to think about what can happen in a simulation. And I seem to remember quite a few people saying, oh, yeah, no problem. If we're stuck here, we'll go to a hotel. You know, the thing is, just a second, the people who can't move out of that country, they're going to be there as well. So where are you going to go? And people, oh, just said not thought about that. And that is, again, got to start looking at these things properly. Getting, risk managers have sort of got getting that depth to the risk assessment. And then you'll find things underneath, which I think really should be sorted out now rather than later. It's, it's, it's extremely challenging to do this, but, but oh. some of the simulations that we saw in and around the, 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 the last um, threat of pandemic um, was, um, it involved um, external third parties, including their critical um, suppliers, the emergency services, perhaps some of the local transport and infrastructure, um, and, and clients that can make the, the scenario as real as possible and, and, and start to consider events and issues like that that are outside of their direct control, uh, again, are probably going to be better prepared um, for, a, for an event when it does happen. Like I say, yeah, I mean, let's not be put down or get disappointed by some of these simulations that totally failed, because I think it, you know, we, the Brits have got to get real with this. Yeah. If you make a mistake, the next time you're not going to make that mistake. And I think there's quite a few. The best uh, plans I've seen are those where they've made a major mistake before. Perhaps coming on to um, the issue of uh, actually plans and stuff. Well, first, there's a question here from um, Srinivasan uh, Srinda of National Insurance, and they ask about they ask about India specifically, how a country like that should take steps perhaps to um, prepare for a, a pandemic, given the fact they're an emerging economy. But you could probably expand that to the whole BRICS and, and other economies that are emerging economies. And the fact that yeah, they are economies which are very much based on um, trade and stuff and, baked, um, and exporting goods. Perhaps I'll come to you first on that, Malcolm. Well, I think it, it is about them understanding the, the, the risks that, 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 that are peculiar to their particular area. Um, understanding those risks and then trialling them and then developing ways to, to combat them. And, and I do th really think that it is all about understanding their own peculiar risks or individual risks that they've got there. Um, and without a doubt, they are faced with different challenges to, to someone like the UK. And that's why I would say they've got to have their own unique uh, and peculiar um, plans and, and preparation for it. Martin? Interesting, I have a question from India because they really did get hit by 1918. And I think when we... When you, if you just said to me in 1918, where would the best place for you to be to escape the pandemic? I think there's only one island in the actual world that escaped it completely. I would probably have said Philadelphia or San Francisco, because especially in, um, uh, in Philadelphia, there was huge amounts of um, uh, army doctors there and nurses. They knew it was going to come, they knew Boston uh, had been hit. They were ready for it. Everything was, somebody said, exemplary was the phrase and they had money by the government to, to prepare for it. So Philadelphia, spot on. But then things just totally collapsed. And within a couple of weeks, it just went absolutely chaotic. M major uh, 
your city. We had death rates of something like a uh, week in uh, October, it was something like 50 or 60. Next week, 700. Next week, 2,800. Next week, 4,800. Next week, 3,000. Next week, 1,000. And that is just something which suddenly happened so fast. And that was only a, um, <coughs> the, the 1918 uh, virus wasn't particularly um, transmissible. It was just pathogenity was an issue. But certainly, the, um, you, you, you just got to conceive what these things had happened and try and plan around them. The big issue in Philadelphia was all these people dying. Look at the mortuary facilities. There was only one on Wood Street, and that was just had about 30 people. Into, normally, to Philadelphia, that was a major issue. And um, again, like I'm trying to say, you've got to, you've got to consider that people aren't going to help you. And that's something a lot of risk managers don't seem to, to have grasped. Perhaps the first time they did do it was Katrina, where the state just said, like, leave it, you're on your own. And again, that, that could, could well happen here, because things just get so uh, bogged down. I mean, there was one hospital, I think, um, Lebanon, in uh, Philadelphia. And there were just three nurses there one day just to um, try and uh, sort things out. It was just it was chaotic. San Francisco General, I think there was about 3,600 people, 900 of them died. It was just absolutely mayhem. It was almost like, you know, the um, 14th century uh, pictures of what, uh, what plague was like. And, it, and like I'm saying, OK, perhaps not in the UK that could happen again. And certainly America to make sure that that's not going to happen again there. But look at the third world. You've got to feel really sorry for them. What's got to happen is, like you say, these people like uh, Ferguson will help the WHO find out what the virus is and straight away what we're going to do. We've got to get as much um, of the... Of, uh, uh, Tamiflu or a vaccine to these places as fast as we can and I can only say the things I've seen uh, that is there's a lot of work to be done there but there's a lot more extra work to be done for, for, for often the Roche you make Tamiflu uh, during, during the um, 2005 and Turkey first got the um, uh, first couple of cases straight away within 24 hours bump on the uh, airport uh, that the Tamiflu love Tamiflu to sort things out but the thing is, if a major issue happens, what we're going to do with, the, uh, with them, some sort of vaccines and that sort of thing? Because there's only about 20 countries in the world who can make vaccines in the present egg state. A lot of science knocking about trying to do things without eggs, but it's still quite experimental. Again, who, if you have, it's a great question for a government, if you have a pandemic, are we going to be affected by a spread of the third world? What are you going to do with your Tamiflu? Do you give it to, your, do you give it to your, your people in the UK? Or do you give some of it to this um, WHO uh, effect? And there's only a couple of countries so far who've even considered what the effect on the third world could be. I think France and America, they've said, whatever happens, 10% of our vaccine at least will go to the third world, to the WHO, to distribute to the third world. And that's it. They've got to stop the spread if something major happens. And, that, and there's not a lot really that I can see there. Um, things have been started out in that regard yet. Okay, well uh, on that note, unfortunately we've run out of time for today's broadcast. I'd like to thank uh, my panellists Richard, Elaine, uh, Martin and Malcolm. Uh, just to remind you that this video is in association with the Chartered Insurance Institute and is part of an ongoing series called Future Risk Covered. If you want to read more about it, go to www.postonline.co.uk forward slash tag forward slash future hyphen risk and you can find out more about this issue and others associated with this campaign. That's all from me for now. Goodbye.